passage in Prophets and Kings, <clears throat> which I think Dario read from his little computer. Uh, I don't have it in front of me. Um, but what it says is that the children were as verily in captivity in this long period of persecution, speaking of the 1,206 years of papal persecution, as were they held in bondage in Egypt. She clearly makes a comparison with the captivity of the 1,260 years and the captivity in Egypt. And then if you have an Ellen White study Bible, um, and under Revelation 18, in the study Bible, there is a quote that comes from Review and Herald, December 13th, 1892. And it says, As God called the children of Israel out of Egypt that they might keep his Sabbath, so he calls his people out of Babylon that they might not worship the beast or his image. So she compares for a second time these captivities. Um, they're interchangeable. So I, I erased that for the purpose of just putting it all back up there one more time to kind of review before we get back in there. But depending on how you want to identify the time period in Egypt, either the, the prophecy is 400 years or 430 years, this time period in Egypt is paralleled to the captivity of the 1260 years. All right? Right? Okay. Amen? Long day, huh? All right. When they come out of Egypt at Passover, we already looked at last presentation. It was 490 years until who? To Samuel. Okay. And Samuel anoints the first king, Saul. And from Saul until the last king, Zedekiah, 490 years. And... <clears throat> These 490 years are probationary periods, okay? And then in this history, we then find the 70 years, which is the time period from the conquering of Jerusalem, which was a three-step process, beginning with Jehoiakim, Jehoiachin, then Zedekiah, until the fall of Babylon, and then there, immediately thereafter, we see Cyrus raised up, followed by Darius, followed by Artaxerxes, which begins the 2300-year prophecy, which brings us to where? 1844. Are you, are you with me? <laughs> okay. That should be an easy one. Um, where, when's the first angel's message arrive in history? 1798, first angel's message, this is 1798, second angel's message, third angel's message, 1844. This begins the investigative judgment, right? Um, that takes us down into this history to say here, fourth angel's message. When we say fourth angel's message, we're talking about Revelation 18, which... Um, expresses two voices, so it's not a singular angel, it's a two-step process. Um, when this message here is empowered, when this mighty angel comes down, it's paralleling when this angel came down, right? Amen? Amen. Okay, you gotta, I'll go as slow as I have to to keep you with me, so let me know you're with me. And from, this is 1840 <coughs> now, to 1844, the second, or the, the door closes in this history at the Sunday Law in the United States. But when the Sunday Law in the United States arrives and the door closes for Adventism, that will be our, ad, modern Adventism's, third test. Right? right? The door closes on the parable of the, of the virgins, in the parable of the ten virgins, at the third test. That's where it closed for the Millerites back here in 1844. And the first test is empowered when the mighty angel of Revelation 10 comes down on August 11, 1840, when Islam is restrained. And our first test is empowered on September 11, 2001, when the mighty angel of Revelation 18 comes down. So here's 1840. Here's 2001. Okay. So 
Now the mighty angels come down with a little book open in his hand and the sprinkling of the latter rain has begun and the judgment of the living has started. <laughs> and we have a three-step testing process to navigate through here. The third test is the Sunday law. That's Revelation 18.4. And I heard another voice saying, come out of her, my people. Everyone with me? So right here we have the, the sprinkling of the latter rain. And then when the church is purified at the Sunday law test, we have the full outpouring of the latter rain. Without major. Major before the Sunday law. Without major after the Sunday law. And this ends... <coughs> When the second door is closed, the first door in this history is closed right here at the Sunday Law. It's closed on Adventism because judgment begins in the house of God. The second door in this history closes when Michael stands up, Daniel 12.1. Then comes the seven last plagues, the return of Christ. Right? Okay. What's interesting about this is there's... The Lord is leading his people back to the foundations of Adventism. The foundations of Adventism are represented on this chart. All right? This is the chart that Sister White says was directed by the hand of the Lord and should not be altered. She says that the Lord held his hand over a mistake, singular, in some of the figures, plural, on this chart. And what he held his hand over was this corner up here. And when he removed his hand... They then saw, according to Sister White in early writings, they then saw that the same evidence that had led them to predict 1843 was then found to be identifying 1844. And that's just how she says it. She's saying that um, they were wrong on this prophecy and this prophecy in terms of identifying it as 1843. But when the Lord removed his hand, then they saw that this prophecy and this prophecy ended in 1844. Then the, she says, God is in the publishment of this chart in 1850. She says that from, she tells us specifically from 1844 to 1846 was the period in, in our history, in our history, where they would come together to study the truce, and when they couldn't find the truce, then and only then Sister White would be taken off in vision and she'd be provided light. From 1844 to 1846, what were they studying? They weren't studying these truths. They even had this figured out before 1844. Okay, what they were studying is what we call the pillars. This chart is what Sister White calls the foundations, the platform. But this chart, where she was told, told her husband that the Lord had told him to make the chart, this, a new chart, to correct the mistake on this chart, and everything on this chart is represented on this chart, but this chart doesn't just have the foundation and platform, it has the pillars down here in this corner, the Sabbath, the third angel's message, the law of God, and from 1844 to 1846, that's what they were coming to grips with. What is the heavenly sanctuary? What is the Sabbath? What is the third angel's message? And so this chart is the foundation and the pillars. This is the foundation. Sister White says both of these charts are a fulfillment of Habakkuk 2, verses 2 and 3. And in Habakkuk 2, it says, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run, that readeth it. Okay. How do you run when you read this? You run when you read this in fulfillment of Daniel 12, 3, 4, 9, and 10. Okay? When the book is unsealed, many shall run to and fro in God's word. So if you want to run to and fro in God's word in this time period of history, then you need to be standing on these two tables because write the vision and make it plain and write it upon tables that he that readeth it may run to and fro in God's word and understand the increase of knowledge that takes place at the end of the world. This being the platform and foundation of Adventism, if you're not standing on those truths, then even if you'd run to and fro in God's word, you're not going to understand what you're reading. Okay, this is, this is where you have to be running to and fro in God's word. This comes into history in 1842. This comes into history in 1850. And these are identified in God's word as tables. That's what, what Habakkuk calls them, is tables. In the plural. So at the beginning of modern Israel's history, the Lord gives modern Israel two tables to mark that he entered into covenant with them. These are the two tables. At the beginning of ancient Israel history, he gave them two tables, the two tables of the Ten Commandments. When it comes to the time period when the Lord's about ready to divorce ancient Israel, the leaders of ancient Israel didn't know what the two tables were. He was standing in front of them and they crucified him. And here we are at the end of the world. And the leadership of Seventh-day Adventist Church tells us that this is incorrect, 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 that this is incorrect. And if you're incorrect on this, even if you don't understand it, you destroy this. It's easy, easy math. 
So here we are at the end of the world, and we're supposedly still Seventh-day Adventists, but the, the truth that is the foundation, according to inspiration of Adventism, we couldn't defend it if we were forced to in a, in a, in a courthouse. Not, not with where, what the theological understanding is on this chart. And we've rejected this other stuff, and that's bad, but it's a fulfillment of prophecy. It's, it's nothing more than what the Pharisees were doing when their two tables were walking among them, and they hung them on a cross. All right, so here we are at the end of the world, arguing about whether the man that Sister White calls the chosen one, William Miller, was really directed by the angel Gabriel or not. Because Sister White says it was Gabriel that directed his mind. And he was led, according to him, to understand this point in time, 508, which has a relation to 1290 and 1335. He says he was led to understand this point in time, which is the starting point for this time prophecy. And he was led to understand this point in time, which is the starting point for this prophecy. It's the three things where he says he was led to understand. 508, 677, 457. And here we are at the end of the world saying, you know, he was a farmer, right? And he, he, he didn't ever go to any universities, right? And he didn't understand the Greek and the Hebrew, did he? Okay, that's where we're at, at the end of the world. And then, of course, we, I've always claimed just from the start, it made, made sense to me, based on Sister White saying, this chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and it should not be altered. My logic was, like Wagner of Jones and Wagner history in 1888. You know what Wagner says about that statement in early writing 74? He says, it's clear where Sister White says that she is endorsing this chart in early writing 74. He says, it's clear that she's endorsing the pioneer position that the daily is paganism. Therefore, she's a false prophet, and he goes off in the darkness. Okay, that's what he rejected her on, because of early writing 74. Because you can't get around it, although they do. They argue about it. They say she really doesn't mean that. But Wagner was honest enough in his going off into darkness to admit that in early writing 74, she's identifying that the daily is paganism. <laughs> of course, we all know the story about Leroy Froome, right? He's, he's, the, he's the godfather of those in Adventism that fight against the daily, and he wrote, he wrote an unpublished man, manuscript. Uh, when was that published? 1946. Uh, okay, in 1946-47. And any argument you hear about the daily today is derived from that unpublished manuscript. If you're familiar with all the various arguments on the daily, all you have to do is pick up his unpublished manuscript that circulates around Adventism. You'll see all, those article, all the arguments right there in that. Isn't it funny, nobody knows about this chart, and one sister that discovers this chart is hidden behind a file cabinet in the vault in Andrews University, so she checks it out of the vault so she can study it. So when she checks it out, she has to sign out a, a release paper in order to take it out and look it over, and so you can see who the last person was that had it. And whoever the last person won, he's, was, he's obviously the person that tried to hide it behind the file cabinet, and the guy's name is Leroy Froome. But why would he want to hide this chart, which Sister White says, I saw that God was in the publishment of this chart. Why would he want to hide this chart? Well, the, over here, when it comes to the daily, it simply says, daily taken away. You know? But not on this chart. On this chart, it says, daily taken away. Pagan dominion, or the daily taken away. This chart's back and white, no argument there. He, the daily on this chart, this is the corrected chart. The Sister White says that God was in the publishment of it. it, it there's no ambiguity in this one. The daily is paganism. Okay, so when we come here to the end of the world, and who was the first person in history to identify the daily as paganism? Yeah. William Miller, when we come here to the end of the world, one of the things we're doing is we're making a decision that even though Sister White says it was the angel, of Gab angel Gabriel that directed William Miller to his understanding of prophecy, that this guy's work is not valid. Okay, whether he's a farmer or whatever reason, didn't understand the Hebrew. One of the things that's being challenged is his work. So this particular study, one of the things that's real nice about it is these prophecies that are on this chart, there's a second testimony to them that hasn't really been recognized before it, and if you get a second testimony, what, is, what does that mean? It's established. it's established. Okay. It's established. So that, that's, that's one of the nice things about this study. All right? And you've, if you've seen 
You've seen part of it before. Okay, we'll try to break this down to you, and we're not working out of our notes, so I have to check, see what I'm leaving behind. Okay, let's go back to Isaiah 23 and start there. Yeah, we're in my notes, but uh, on page, probably on page 111, but I really haven't been working off notes since Tuesday, all right, so I don't know if we're going to get to these, these notes. On, on Isaiah 23, verse 1, it says this, The burden of Tyre, how ye ships of Tarshish, for it is laid waste, so that there is, none, there is no house, no entering in, from the land of Kittim, it is revealed to them. And in the end of our last presentation, we let Isaiah 23 identify for us what Tyre was. What's Tyre? It's the papacy at the end of the world. It's the, it's the her, the she, that goes out and commits fornication with the kings of the earth, and she does so after a period of 70 years. Okay, look down here to verse 15. It says, And it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten 70 years according to the days of one king. After the end of the 70 years shall Tyre sing as a harlot. So let's just, we explained this before, but there were some brothers in the hallway just a minute ago that they didn't hear the explanation or it wasn't done well, but I had to work through it again, so I'm assuming that we all need to work through it again. All right? on this particular point. It's pretty easy to see that Tyre is the papacy at the end of the world, right? Yes. Okay. And she's going to be forgotten for 70 years, whatever that means. We haven't really nailed down what it means to be forgotten. But the 70 years at the end of the world, it can't be several, 70 literal years, can it? Because time is no longer. But the definition of what the 70 years is right there in the verse. It says, as the days of one king. Okay, the 70 years is the days of one king. What's a king in Bible prophecy? A kingdom. A kingdom. Okay, as the days of one kingdom. And what we're saying, we're saying that the papacy was forgotten in 1798. All right? Because in 1798... When the papacy receives the deadly wound, the next kingdom of Bible prophecy arrives in history, and who is that? So, the papacy is forgotten for 70 years, and this 70 years is not 70 years, it's just a period of time that represents the time period of the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy. The first kingdom of Bible prophecy is Babylon, followed by Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome. Papal Rome it receives its deadly wound in 1798. Then the United States is the sixth kingdom, and the United States is the sixth kingdom until the Sunday law. That's Revelation 13, 11. That's Daniel 11:41. 41. At the Sunday law, then the, the next point of conquest for the king of the north is verse 42, the Egypt, the conquering of all the countries of the world. And that's what Sister White says. First, the United States passes a Sunday law, then every country on the globe is led to follow his example. First, the papacy conquers the glorious land of Daniel 11:41. then it conquers Egypt, representing all the nations of the world. Daniel 11:42, when the papacy, the king of the north, conquers Egypt, is rep representing Revelation 17, when the ten kings, the United Nations, agree to give their kingdom unto the beast for one hour. The final kingdom is this, this uh, twofold kingdom of the papacy in the United Nations. Church and state is what we call it. So in any case, the 70 years here, the 70 years represents the time period when the United States is the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy. Yeah. You follow the logic even if you haven't had time to test it? Yeah. Okay, let me ask you a question that, that we've dealt with, but it may be a little bit... May, this may not be so connected to what I just said that you'll get the question right off the bat. If we say that this, just as a point of reference, if this right here is the Sunday law in the United States, then this would be the 70 years 
for the papacy, right? But it's not really time, because time is no longer. Okay? The 70 years that Tyre is forgotten, for 70 years, the days of one king, right? This is, this is the, the kingdom of the United States, is the time when the papacy is forgotten for 70 years. You with me? Okay. This is the Sunday Law, USA. So what happens in Adventism that leads up to the Sunday Law? What happens in Adventism that leads up and climaxes at the Sunday Law? The repetition of the three angels' message, right? The three angels' message have to be repeated, and Adventism goes through a three-step testing process. The third is where the door is closed, and that's at the Sunday Law, right? So, so I want you to see that this is the Sunday Law in the United States, but this is the third of three tests that confronts us at the end of the world. Do you see that? Follow the logic? When's this test empowered? 2001, 9-11, 2001. Okay. Uh, the first test is empowered. Everyone with me there? Okay, so do you notice something? That these three tests are paralleling the three decrees? So when the third test comes, the Sunday Law, it's no longer the days of the United States of that kingdom, the 70 years is over, and what's going to happen? That starts a 2300-year prophecy, doesn't it? Papacy is governed by the 2300-year prophecy. Now, now, maybe this will be easier to see. How many of you are familiar with... How, no, no, no. How many are, of you are not familiar with the 2520? It's, raise your hands a little bit higher, okay. All right. Over here, over here, William Miller knew there were two 2520s, but William Miller was having myopic vision. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but he could only see one thing, all right? And I'm not criticizing. He was seeing what the angel Gabriel was wanting him to see, all right? It's not a criticism. But all he was seeing was 1843, 1843, 1843, 1843. So when he seen both 2520 time prophecies, he was led to understand that the one that the emphasis needed to be put on is the one that ended in 1843, actually in 1844. But William Miller, if you read his writings, he knew that there were two 2520 time prophecies. Amen. They're identifying the punishment of the northern kingdom of Israel for 2,520 years and the punishment of the southern kingdom for 2,520 years. Okay? Those time prophecies start in 723, that's for the northern kingdom, and 677 for the southern kingdom, and this one ends in 1798. This one ends in 1844. And the, the thing about these two time prophecies, when you study them carefully, they have different emphasis, all right? This one is carrying with it the promise of the gather, gathering, all right? This one's illustrated by Nebuchadnezzar. Was not Nebuchadnezzar punished for 2,520 days? Right? Seven times, that's what it is, it's 2,520 days. And the story of Nebuchadnezzar is the story of a kingdom removed, but a kingdom restored at the end of 2,520. Okay? So this time prophecy down here of Nebuchadnezzar, a 2,520, it's talking about the gathering. This is the punishment of ancient Israel for breaking the covenant, but it came with the promise that at the end of the punishment, the Lord would gather modern, spiritual Israel and enter into covenant with them. And that's what, just what happened in 1844. Amen. But this 2520, this is against the northern kingdom. Ephraim is joined to his idols. Leave him alone. The northern kingdom, Ephraim, Israel. This is Belshazzar. Did Belshazzar have a 2520? Yes. Some Adventists don't understand that. But the writing on the wall, many, many Tekel Yufarsen, is also... Um, monetary value from that day and age, it adds up to 2520, okay? So there was on Belshazzar's wall, there was his pronouncement, but the story of Belshazzar is the story of a kingdom that is removed forever, okay? So 
this 2520 represented by Belshazzar. There's no, it's not emphasizing the gathering at the end, although there is, I'm not denying that there's a connection between these two because it's the 46-year period where the Lord gathers his people that he enters into covenant with, and this marks the beginning of the gathering, no doubt about it, but the emphasis of this is on the scattering, and therefore you find in this history that the scattering of this history is accomplished by two desolating powers, paganism and papalism, that the Bible speaks about trampling down the host and the people. And when you go dead center, right here, in the middle of this 2520, you come to 538, and suddenly you see that you have 1260 years when paganism is trampling down the sanctuary and the host, followed by 1260 years when papalism is trampling down the sanctuary and the host. No way that's an accident. No matter what the modern theologians say. No way that's an accident. All right? So what I'm saying is, right here, we have two periods of 1260 years, and you and I have already identified that the 1260-year time period of Thyatira in Revelation chapter 2, verse 21, she was given space to repent. It's a probationary time. This is a probationary time. Do you see what happened just there? This 70 years is paralleling this 70 years, and this 70 years is preceded by two probationary times. 490 years, 490 years. This is for state. This is for church. This 70 years is preceded by 1260 years of probationary time towards the church, the papacy, preceded by 1260 years of probationary time for the state, paganism. Ooh. Do you see that? Well, maybe, maybe William Miller was right about the 2520. What do you think? It just connects pretty well with what we understand about Adventism. But if this is so, then we'd expect to see 49 years, right? If that's what it took. What's the 49 years? It's where Adventism's weak. From 457, 49 years later, what have they done? They rebuild the streets and the walls. In troublous times, the temples built before the third decree, the foundation of the temples built, built during the history of the first decree, the temples built during the history of the second decree. What's getting built in these 49 years are the streets and the walls in troublous times. All right? But there's a, another prophecy here that impacts the 1260 years, and we're going to put it here, predicting when Messiah would arrive. Who's the Messiah? Jesus. When's he become the Messiah? That is baptism, when the mighty angel, the dove, comes down. Okay? That begins the sacred week, does it not? Okay? Um, that ends with the stoning of Stephen here. And in the midst of the week, he's cut off. So we have one prophecy, 49 years, the Messiah, second the third, the cross. The fourth, the stoning of Stephen. What happens at the stoning of Stephen? Michael stands up. That's what we want to see there. there everything you said was probably true, although I couldn't hear all everything. But we want to see Michael stand up, because down here we're going to see Michael stand up. We want to see the connection. And then we come down here to 1844, the arrival of the three angels' message in 1798. Comes to 1844. All right. And then what happens? The judgment begins. All right, the judgment begins. Michael stands up down here. This is the beginning, the judgment. Well, all these things are true, but before we pile all the truth we understand onto these lines, we have to see them at the very basic level. All right, so I have to guide some of the things. I'm not prepared to, to defend all those things, even if they do fit. So what I'm saying is that we should see something right here when the streets and the walls, not of Jerusalem. Okay, this, the Bible, have you ever heard someone say the Bible is the tale of two cities? 
Uh, you know, I've heard that ever since I became an Adventist. The Bible is the tale of two cities. It's the tale of the city of Babylon and the city of Jerusalem. And it is. It is. Um, I like saying that because um, Elder Fandel, when he critiqued the Time of the End magazine, one of, the, one of his big arguments about w- that what we teach about the last six verses of Daniel 11 is that, well, Pippinger says that um, the vision of the Uli vision of Daniel chapter 8 because the, I say in the time of the end that that's a river that's dealing with the investigative judgment. Therefore, it leads to the sea of glass because that's where it takes you. If you go into the uh, most holy place with Christ is a sea of glass. And I say, but the, the Hittical River of the last vision of Daniel that begins in chapter 10, 11, and 12, the Hittical vision, I say, that's the vision of the king of the north. And it leads you to the lake of fire because it's talking about the papacy. So I got metaphorical that... The Uli River about the Mare vision takes you to the Sea of Glass. And the Hittical vision about the King of the North takes you to the Lake of Fire. Seemed to work for me. And he said, that was one of his strongest criticisms about what we teach about the last six verses of Daniel 11. But he had just come out with a book on Daniel. And he says in his book right off the bat, the Bible is the tale of two cities. Babylon and Jerusalem. And that's just the same thing I just said, only differently. It's the story of Jerusalem and Babylon. This is the covenant prophecy or the the covenant record of Jerusalem. God's covenant. The holy covenant. This is the record of the satanic covenant. All right, But this line, it's controlled or directed by this line. Amen. Okay, we've already shown in, in the last presentation, and we've shown it many times, that right in here, in 508, this is 538, right? 508 back here is where paganism, the state, is taken away in order to prepare the way for the papacy. So we're, we already saw that this 30-year history that leads to in the empowerment of the papacy, who gives its testimony for 1260 years, is the same as this 30-year period of Christ from a baby until his baptism, where he's empowered, and he gives his testimony for three and a half years that leads to his death. So we can see right down here already that this line, the satanic covenant, is being governed, that was the word I was looking for, by this line. You follow me? So what I'm saying is if you look closely, you're going to see something that identifies when the streets and the walls are built. What's, if in, in, biblical, in a big biblical city, the ones we're talking about anyway, they always want to have walls, right? Yes, sir. You know, whose idea was that? Uh, some Aramis, okay. But anyway, that's a different story too. Streets and walls have to be built, but if you're going to build a city of that nature in that time period, the city's not complete until you build the streets and the walls, right? So this is the satanic line here. And right here is the Sunday law. And the Sunday law is Daniel 11, 41. What's verse 42? That's when a whole, all the nations of the world are brought into the possession of the papacy, right? The city is complete, right? Is not a city in Bible prophecy a kingdom? Ah, verse 42, the kingdom is complete. This is the threefold union. The ten kings of Revelation 17 have agreed to give their kingdom unto the beast. The beast, the dragon, and false prophet are fully united in verse 42 of Daniel 11. Is that how you understand it? Yes. That's the streets and the walls in troublous times. They're completed right there. Right? Yep. Okay. Yeah, a close facsimile. So let's, let's, I, I want to leave one thing out. Let's drop down to here. Okay. At the end of the 2300 years, what happens? It's right here. You see, you, you already got it figured out. Yeah, I can ask you any question now, and you know all you have to do is look up here, and, and your answer's up here, right? Judgment begins. But in this history, here the 
papacy's taking control of the world. This is Daniel 11:42. And down here, uh, this isn't where the investigative judgment would begin, is it? Where is the judgment of the papacy marked? Where is the Ah. Uh, yeah, it's somewhere in there, right? Daniel 11:45. Let's put verse 45 here. 44, 45, actually. Uh, tidings out of the east and north shall trouble him, and he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly wake, make away many. But he shall come to his end between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, and none shall help him. There's a message that comes right in here. And the papacy comes out to meet this message, to block this message. And in Daniel 12, 1, it says, at that time, what? Yes. Michael shall stand up and judgment shall begin. Right? Yes. Seven last plagues. Okay. So, all right. Let's go back now. You've seen a little piece of that. And we have some time. What about the second decree? What about the second decree where? On our time. Just right here? What can you tell us about that? That this is... This is September 11, 2001, and this is the Sunday Law. And in the two presentations we did on Revelation 18, I gave it my best shot to explain that. It's the second right. decree. Yeah, it's not the second decree. This is the repetition of the three angels' messages in our day and age. The second, the second decree, as you're expressing it, is verses 2 and 3 of Revelation 18. Babylon has fallen, has fallen. And it's not identifying the Seventh-day Adventist church. It's identifying that the foundational message is being rejected. It has been empowered in September 11, 2001. The foundational message is, is being rejected, and those that reject it go into verse 3, which is a description of the image of the beast. You reject that empowered message, and you form the image of the beast, and you receive strong delusion, and then you come to the Sunday Law and demonstrate that you prepared a character for the mark of the beast. Or you receive this empowered message in 2001, <laughs> And you come to the expression, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, which is understood by these charts. The 2520s are what identify the fall of Babylon. And you then pass that test, and you develop the image of Christ. And when it, this is the testing. Of, this is the first temple cleansing of Adventism. Okay, this is where it might get a little bit out of control, but that's all right. How can I help you, Brother Franz? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, back, start all over, and if, if someone, I'm not following your accent, so... Th I said that you have the two charts. The two charts. Yes, two charts. two charts. You have a probation time. Probation time. Probation time for church and states. Probationary time. The two, two lines. Yeah. yeah. And the second chart, it seems to be wider. One thousand three, twice sixty, and the first... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, th th this, isn't, this isn't dealing with equal time. Okay, what he's saying is, I'm saying this is probationary time, and this is probationary time, and I'm comparing it with this probationary time, and this probationary time, and, uh, but one's 490 years, and one is 1260 years. What I'm saying is that these, these time periods have been identified by inspiration as probationary time, so I'm not expecting to see a time-for-time -time relationship. I'm saying that this is a symbol of probationary time. She was given space to repent. This is a symbol of probationary time. You forgive him seven times, seventy times. All, I, all I'm saying is that the way marks, the way marks on these lines line up perfectly, but this isn't about prophetic time. Okay, this is something that the Lion of the tribe of Judah is letting us understand now after 1844, and after 1844, we should not be seeking for time. We should be seeking for what these things represent. As an example, so, so just one more, I, I know you, this is new for you. When you look at the three falls of Babylon, okay, the punishment for Nimrod is that he was scattered. Okay, this word scatter is what we call the 2520. The 2520, the Bible prophets call it the scattering. So in the first fall of Babylon with Nimrod, the punishment was that he was scattered. The second fall of Babylon that's illustrated with Nebuchadnezzar, he was punished for 2520. Okay, it's the same thing, only with, with Nimrod it's called scattering. With Nebuchadnezzar it's called seven times. 
but those are prophetic symbols that are interchangeable. So when you get to the third fall of Babylon, it's many, many tekel upharsin, which adds up to 2520. So you're, you're seeing the same punishment for all three falls of Babylon, but one is symbolized by scattering, one by seven times, and one by many, many tekel upharsin. We're dealing with prof the prophetic symbolism that's represented. You have to understand that. If you're going to understand Revelation 18, verse 2, where it says Babylon is fallen, it's pointing to those histories to demonstrate the pronouncement that comes when the warning message is rejected. And the warning message was empowered on September 11th, 2001. So verse 2 of Revelation 18, when it says Babylon is fallen, is fallen, it has nothing to do with calling the Seventh-day Adventist church Babylon because the spirits of the prophets are subject unto the prophets. 1 Corinthians 14, 32, For God is not the author of confusion, and Sister White plainly says the Seventh-day Adventist church is and never will be Babylon. So that requires in any student of prophecy that struggles with what's being re represented with verse 2 of Revelation 18 of Babylon has fallen, has fallen, any student of prophecy that understands that that comes before the Sunday law has to determine that that isn't a pronouncement that the Adventist church is Babylon, it's something else. And the something else that it is, is that ba the fall of Babylon was illustrated with Nimrod, Nebuchadnezzar, and Belshazzar. It's a symbol of the rejection of a warning message. Yeah. And it's by just divine inspiration that in every one of those histories, that symbol is directly associated with the 2520 because our testing message is the return to the foundational truths and the one that they all want to reject is this one right here, the 2520, which is the scattering, which is the seven times, which is many, many tekel yafarsin. And as that test comes to Adventism, if you go ahead and reject it, then you're in verse 3, and you're forming the image of the beast in your own experience, just one verse before the Sunday Law, where you demonstrate that you've developed a character for the mark of the beast. That's these histories here, all right? But when you get there to the Sunday law in this line, that begins, I don't really want to say counterfeit, but it sounds good, makes sense. The counterfeit 2300, okay? It's, it's, it's perfect. <laughs> it's perfect. It's, this is not authored by any human being. This is offered by, authored by the line of the tribe of Judah, and anything he does is perfect. One quick question to clarify for people. Uh, 310, the second test is verse 2 and 3. It's the pronouncement and the formation of the image of the beast. Everyone with me? Amen. Okay. Now the problem with this, that you, you need to remind me, I, I, this is the best way to do it. This is the best way to do it. I've said it over and over again in the path of the just guys. They tease me the last few times I've been with them. They say, you've turned into a preacher. <laughs> All right. I don't want to be a preacher. I've had no conviction that I'm a preacher. I'm going to be held accountable for being a teacher, and I don't mind doing question and answers as we go along. But you have to do one thing if we're going to do this, and I don't care if we do this. You have to remind me to repeat the question so we're getting it recorded, or the people that watch this on DVD, they're not going to know what's going on. So, Brother Kent. Don't forget to tell them what the three tests are. We already have. Go ahead, tell me what I'm missing. The image of the beast test. Okay, okay, all right, he's, he's saying, why don't I just tell him what the three tests are, okay? And what he's referring to is that for 15 years we've identified, or more, that the three tests for Adventism at the end of the world are the spirit of prophecy, followed by the image of the beast test, followed by the Sunday law test, Okay. And I, and I still understand that. But we started teaching that. We started understanding that over 20 years ago, that particular truth, okay? And what I'm saying now is that the first test is the image of the beast, is the, is the, the spirit of prophecy. That's the first test. But I already said it here tonight. You can't separate 
the foundational test from the spirit of prophecy. The first test is not simply the spirit of prophecy. It's the return to the foundations. Because in all these histories, when the divine symbol comes down, right here on 2001, it marks where the foundation is laid. It's uh, when Michael comes down to Cyrus in Daniel 10. Cyrus passes the first decree. In the history of the first decree, they built the foundation of the temple. It's when the dove comes down on Jesus, then John the Baptist sets forth the foundational messages of his time. It's when the Lord comes down and confronts Moses with the test of circumcision, and Moses presents the foundational truth for his time, which is the Sabbath. And the foundational truth for the Millerites is represented here on this chart, and the angel came down on August 11, 1840, and this chart comes into history in 1842. This is the foundational test. So we've taught for over, we've understood for over 20 years that the first test is the spirit of prophecy, but now we understand that the first test has to do with the foundations. And I'm here to tell you, if you don't have complete and firm confidence in the spirit of prophecy, you're not involved with this test. Because this argument is to test Adventism. Test everything about Adventism. It tests you. Do you believe what Sister White says when she says the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord and it should not be altered? And some of you may say, yes, I do. But do you believe the next paragraph where she says, I was shown that those that gave the judgment hour cry had the cor correct view of the daily. Do you believe that? We don't teach it anymore. Haven't taught it since 1930. Haven't taught it since 1930. Okay, so do you believe that? So it's sort of about the foundational truths, but it's also about what you think, Sister White said, about these foundational truths. That's the first test. The second test that's identified in prophetic, in the prophecies, is a visual test. Okay? The third test is where the door closes, right? In the history of Noah, Noah the door closed on the ark. What happened just before the door closed? The animals getting on the ark. Was probation open when the animals were getting on the ark? In theory, if you saw the animals, animals getting on the ark, you could still get on. It was a visual test. You had to see it. Everybody seems to understand that, right? Say amen if you understand that. Okay, what was the visual test for the, for the Millerites? What was the visual test for the Millerites? This was the visual test. This is the visual test. This was introduced in May of 1842, and William Miller says it's because of this that the churches closed their door, and Sister White says they closed the doors in June of 1842. It was a visual test. Uh, and let's go to Habakkuk, too, so you, you may not understand that this visual test is really a, a, a subject of Scripture, but it is. And... and Are you with me on Habakkuk 2? All the prophets are speaking about the end of the world, aren't they? Amen. Okay. In Habakkuk 2, verse 1, it says this. I will stand upon my watch. Who stands upon their watch? 2, 1. Who stands upon their watch? A watchman. I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say to me. What who will say to me? Who's the he? Okay, I'm going to stand on the watchtower and I'm going to see what Jesus is going to say to me as a watchman. And then the last phrase says, and what I shall answer when I'm reproved. And the Millerites, they take this word reproved and they show that in the Hebrew, it's argued with. So what verse 1 is saying is I'll stand upon my watch as a watchman. I'll stand on the tower and I'll listen to see what the Lord will say to me in the argument or the controversy of my generation. And this was fulfilled for the Millerites. But all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world, and we also know that the Millerite history is repeated to the very letter. So this is for you and I. It says you and I should become watchmen and stand upon the tower and then listen to see what the Lord will tell us our answer is in the controversy of our history. And what is told to the watchman is verse 2. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision... And make it plain upon tables, that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak, and shall not lie, though it tarry. Wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. 
what the Millerites answer was for the controversy of their history was this chart right here. The answer for the controversy of our history is these two charts right here. This is Jeremiah 6, 16, standing in the ways and, and see. Go to the old paths and walk therein. But they said, we will not walk therein. This is the controversy to our history, just like the Millerites had a controversy. This is the answer to the controversy in our history. But notice this. Behold, verse 4, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. Now what's it talking about there? It's talking about someone that's puffed up, right? The Millerite history was the, the fulfillment of the everlasting gospel. And what's the everlasting gospel? It's, it's the work of Christ in producing two classes of believers based upon their response to the introduction of a prophetic message. Okay? Cain and Abel, I want you to come worship before me. Here's how you do it. There's the prophetic word. That prophetic, prophetic word produced two classes of worshipers. All right? So when verse 4 says, when verse 4 says, um, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. Who is that? That's Cain. Okay. This is the one that has heard this prophetic message. The controversy of the, of the Millerite history, the controversy of our history, the answer for that controversy is these charts, and there's one group in Adventism who's going to be lifted up. Lifted up. That's the very root of Satan's problem. Self-exaltation. Gadol. The daily. Okay, this, this is the, the foolish virgins, right? In the everlasting gospel, right? You see, you see it? So what's, what's the next part say? The, the, the just shall live by faith. So the one class is going to live by faith, and the other class is going to be exalting, them, exalting themselves. Now get this, brothers and sisters. The Millerites were walking by sight. By sight. They had a visual test. What was, what was the, the visual test that was allowing them to walk by sight? This. What does this say about the end of the world? The end of the world comes when? When did they think 1843 ended? March 21st. 1844 was the end of 1843. So the Millerites, they're walking by sight. Till March 22nd, 1844. Because they can't use this chart no more. You're not going to say, hey, the Lord's coming in 1844. We, we have to change it by one year, everybody. Uh, we want you to keep looking at this chart that says 1843, 1843. After the first disappointment, this chart gets put away. Right? You're not going to stand with the chart saying the world ends in 1843 while you're in 1844, are you? Okay, so now they're walking by faith. All right. The just shall live by faith. The test that begins separating those that are going to be gadol, the daily, lifted up with pride, the foolish virgins, the 49,950 that continued to pray to Satan in the holy place. The test that separates them from those that have the potential to move into the most holy place with Christ by what? Faith, Faith was the dis first disappointment. Their test was a visual test. They had been walking by sight. But when the visual test was over, they had to walk by faith. The second test is a visual test. The animals are getting on the ark. Sister White says at least 11 times that Nebuchadnezzar's image on the plain to Dura in Daniel chapter 3 is the Sunday law. Were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego the only Jews on the plain to Dura prior to the test? No. Oh, there was a bunch of Hebrews that were building that statue and practicing the music for the, the event. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are simply the only Hebrews that saw the test coming and prepared themselves. There's a visual test that precedes the test where the door closes. If you, you follow me? Okay. So the, in Revelation 18, verses 2 and 3, you're having both, you have having in verse 1, the message in power, the mighty angel comes down. And then you're having a test that has to do with the spirit of prophecy and the foundations. And how you pass that test in verse 2, which rep is represented by the three histories of Babylon, Nimrod, Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar, how you pass, pass that test will determine where you stand in verse 3. In verse 3, 
You're either forming the image of the beast represented by the kings of the earth committing fornication with Rome, which is verse 3, or you're forming the image of Christ. And we form the character that we have. We, we form the character that we will demonstrate at the Sunday Law before the Sunday Law. Okay? This, the ceiling is the settling into the truth both intellectually and spiritually sh so that we will not be moved. And just as soon as we're settled in, the shaking comes. The, the shaking doesn't come before we're settled in. The shaking there she's talking about is the Sunday Law. The Sunday Law, we simply demonstrate what character we prepared in the previous hours of probation because Sister White says more than once, character is never developed in a crisis. It's only demonstrated and the Sunday Law is the crisis. Okay, that's here. That was preaching. I wanted to teach. Okay, we got that settled. That's this here, I hope. All right, it's in the record. That's the third time we've covered that. Right? Okay. Um, now, go back to your notes if you would. We're, we we want to deal with Isaiah 23. Long day, huh? At the end of a long week. Yeah, we're going to go back. We can't. We can't. Passes this by. Well, it's on page 111. No, I think. Okay. You can be on 111. It's where I'm going to start. But I'm, I'm just going to go off the Bible. It's, in verse 1 it says, The burden of Tyre, how you ships of Tarshish, for it is laid waste. Who's Tyre? Papacy. Papacy's laid waste. But the ships of Tarshish, what are they doing? They're howling. So that there is no house, no entering in from the land of Kittim. It is revealed to them. What's the land of Kittim? Well, in prophetic history, it's the place that the Vandals launched the second trumpet attacks against Rome from. When you see the land of Kittim, it's referencing the second trumpet. The truth of verse 1 and the ships of Tarshish is revealed from the message of the trumpets. And the pioneer understanding of the trumpets is the trumpets are the historical forces that bring down Rome. The first four trumpets bring down Western Rome by 476. The fifth and sixth trumpet bring down Eastern Rome in 1453. And they're there when the papacy, Papal Rome, receives the deadly wound in 1798. Whoever the ships of Ch Tarshish are, the truth about them has some kind of connection with Kittim, which in the Bible is associated with the vandals of the second trumpet. So that's part of the co context of who the ships of Tarshish are. Now, if you drop down to um, verse 14, it says, How, you ships of Tarshish? The, and of course... All the prophets are speaking about the end of the world, right? So the ships of Tarshish are going to be howling at the end of the world. We need to understand what the ships of Tarshish are. And what's their relationship to Tyre? Now I'm going to work off your, your notes. It might be a little bit quicker. But I'm going to pass. I'm going to go, I'm not, I'm not going to work off your notes. <laughs> go to Psalms 48.7, please. Psalms 48.7. I'm going to limit this discussion of the ships of Tarshish, and I think I can do it from the word easier than the notes. Everyone, Psalms 48.7. Thou breakest the ships of Tarshish with a east wind. Whoever the ships of Tarshish are that are howling when the papacy comes down. Whoever they are, they're broken with an east wind. Do you see that? Yeah. Okay, go to Ezekiel 27. Ezekiel 27. And we won't spend much time here and we'll take a break and come right back. E Ezekiel 27 Verses 20, Ezekiel 27, verse 25 and 26. 
The ships of Tarshish did sing of thee in the market, and thou was resplendished, replenished and made very glorious in the midst of the seas. Thy rowers have brought thee into great waters. The east wind hath broken thee in the midst of the seas. Whoever the ships of Tarshish are, on the testimony of two, what brings them down is the east wind. Do you see that? The east wind brings down the ships of Tarshish. Go to Genesis 41, 6. Forty-one six, Genesis forty-one six. This is an easy one. We all know this story. Genesis forty-one six. All right. And behold, seven thin ears, and blasted with an east wind, sprung up after them. One short verse. Can you tell me what that story is? Pharaoh's dream, right? He has a dream about seven ears of plenty followed by seven bad ears. But what makes the bad ears bad is the east wind. And what's the story of Pharaoh about? It's the story of Egypt. And what's Egypt the symbol of? The world. And all the prophets, including Moses, are speaking about the end of the world. So this story of Pharaoh is a story about the Egypt at the end of the world. It's the story about the world at the end of time that has a period of plenty. And then it has a period of problems. And what brings the problems to Egypt is the east wind, the very same thing that breaks the ships of Tarshish in the midst of the sea. And this east wind is so bad... The trouble gets so bad on planet Earth in Egypt that first the land is taken in by the United Nations. The money's taken in as you're buying food. And then the people are put into slavery. Isn't that the story? Yeah. All right. This is, how does a one world government take control of the world? The economics represented by the ships of Tarshish are swept away by the east wind. I wonder what the east wind is. <laughs> okay, pardon me. It's <laughs> Go to Revelation 13.2. I hope we all understand that Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning, right? Okay, go to Revelation 13.2. A couple more points. We'll take a break and come back for the closing presentation. We still have to finish this line off a little bit. Revelation 13, 2 says this. And I saw one of the heads as it were... That's verse 3. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him what? His power, his seat, and his great authority. Who's the dragon in this story? In, in chapter 12, it says the dragon is Satan, but Sister White says in Great Controversy, it's, it's pagan Rome. Because Sister White says so. Pagan Rome gave papal Rome here three things. It's power, it's seat, and authority. Pa pagan Rome gave its power, its military might to the papacy beginning in 496 with Clovis. And thereafter, all the way through the 1260 years, the, form, the kings of Europe kept supplying their power to the papacy. That began, it was a progressive period of time. It began in 496 with Clovis. That was its power. It gave its seat to the papacy in the year 330. That was a singular event in history. In the year 330, when Constantine moved the capital from the city of Rome to the, to the city of Constantinople, thus dividing the kingdom into east and west and beginning the disintegration of the Roman Empire. But it gave its civil authority to the papacy in the year 533 with the decree of Justinian, and the reason that Justinian did it, according to the historians, is that in 533, you're already well into the trumpets, bringing Rome to its knees. By 476, Western Rome is gone. All right? It's just Eastern Rome now in 533, and the emperor of Rome struggling to keep his crumbling kingdom together. So he intercedes into a religious controversy in order to try to get some political stability, and the reason he has to intercede is because of the trumpet powers of Revelation 8 and 9 are bringing... 
of eight only at this point, are bringing the world to its knees. The trumpet powers, the trumpet powers are bringing the world to its knees. So the dragon power, pagan Rome, it decides it's going to make a decree identifying the Pope of Rome as the head of the church and the corrector of heretics. He gave its civil authority to the Pope at that time period. And Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning, the first time that the dragon, pagan Rome, gave its civil authority to the papacy was in 533 with the decree of Justinian, and it did so because there was a trumpet power bringing the world to demise, and the only solution was to make the Pope of Rome the head of the churches. And Jesus illustrates the end from the beginning. At the end of the world, there will be a trumpet power that is bringing the world to its knees. And the United States is going to go out to the world and say the only way that we can deal with radical Islam is to bring the world under the authority of a one world government and place the Pope of Rome in the position of authority of that arrangement. And the reason that happens is because the third woe, the seventh trumpet, is the east wind of Islam, and the third woe began to blow on September 11th, 2001. And if you're in this room and you don't think that that's the beginning of the bad corn in Pharaoh's dream, I don't know where your head's been. It's been in the sand. The economics are being swept away, as we speak, right? here, In fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And try to tell me that that didn't start on 9-11, when the Twin Towers were brought down. <laughs> the, the, first, the first woe was Islam attacking the armies of Rome. The second woe was Islam attacking the armies of Rome with explosives. First time in history explosives were introduced in warfare was in the second woe when they brought down Constantinople with cannons. If the first woe was Islam attack, attacking the armies of Rome and the second woe was Islam attacking the armies of Rome with explosives, and in both of those woes, the mode of warfare for Islam was to strike suddenly and unexpectedly. When you get to the third woe, it should be Islam attacking the armies of Rome suddenly and unexpectedly with explosives. And who's the armies of Rome at the end of the world? And what are the two strengths of the United States at the end of the world? Economic, military. And what is the United States at the end of the world? Oh, it's the beast that comes up out of the earth, isn't it? Papacy comes out of the sea in Revelation 13. The United States come out of the earth. So on September 11, 2001, do not ever forget it. Don't forget it. Those two planes, they went into the Twin Towers, symbol of economic strength of the United States. That other plane, it went into the Pentagon, symbol of military strength of the United States. Where'd the fourth plane go? into the earth, symbol of the United States. On September 11th, the third woe arrived in history and the economics of the world began to tumble in fulfillment of Genesis 41 and in fulfillment of the east wind coming back into prophetic history. Isaiah 23 is talking about Tyre being forgotten for 70 years. And at the end of 70 years, it goes out to the kings of the earth and commits fornication. The end of the 70 years, the 70 years are the days of one king. The Sunday law in the United States, that 70 year period, which is the days of the United States as the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy comes to an end. And then this prophecy begins to repeat. This prophecy began on the third decree. This prophecy begins on the repetition of the third angel's message in our time period. Shall we pray and take a break? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we... We thank you for re revealing these truths to where people such as us can see them if we wish to see. But we understand that this message is 
the most hard, direct, serious message that's ever been given to mankind, and we are not, we do not have the right temperament, the right speech, the right abilities to convey this message, to reflect that seriousness, and at the same time accomplish our heart's desire, which is not to, not to chastise and criticize and attack our church members, our, the, our family. We don't know how to do, present this message um, without being just clear, Lord, that probation's about to close and we're in the judgment of the living and it's clear that most people are not going to receive this. We ask that you give us wisdom and grace to accomplish this work, uh, that as this DVD and of these, this whole week goes forth, that you would uh, add your grace to it so those that have ears to hear that trumpet sound might hear. Uh, but Lord, we want to be effective witnesses for this message, we ask that this particular week can be a point in time in each of our experiences where we recognize that you have prepared us with better tools um, to present this message to the world. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.